We live in troubling times. Amen. There's, uh, as I was thinking about this message this week, we live in a time when you never know what you're going to wake up to. You never know what's going to be happening on the news when you wake up. I remember just a couple weeks ago, I woke up, and I woke up a little earlier than I normally do, and I looked at my phone, and it said mass shooting in Las Vegas. 59 people dead. And I thought, man, my heart broke for those people. I thought, what kind of... What kind of time are we living in when somebody just opens up on an innocent group of people and wounded several hundred and killed 59, I think. We live under a constant threat of domestic terrorism. We live under a threat of nuclear war. Seems like every day there's a new natural disaster comes up somewhere, an earthquake or a hurricane or a tsunami, you never know what's going to happen next. And with all of this happening in the world, it's easy to have a troubled heart. It's easy to allow fear and anxiety to build up inside of us. On top of all the things that we face as a nation and as a people, We all have a lot going on individually, don't we? Times are probably tough financially. Maybe the marriage is on the rocks again. Maybe they're talking about a layoff at work. In this world that we live in, it's easy to become troubled. It's easy to become overwhelmed with all the things that the world is shooting at us from every different direction have you experienced that just kind of overwhelmed just like a troubled heart how are we to live as the people of God in such troubled times how are we to respond to all the pain and all the hurt and all the frustration that we see in the world What are we supposed to do? How are we supposed to live? The answer to that is simple. We're to live with peace in the midst of the trouble. We're to live with peace that goes beyond our circumstances. We're to live with peace. And so today I want to talk about, I didn't title this message, but if I had to title it, I guess I would call it how to live with peace in the middle of trouble. Now I want to say a couple things before we get into the message. First off, I didn't say how to make all your troubles go away. Oftentimes we as the people of God are guilty of praying that all our troubles go away. If you look at the Bible, friends, you'll find that God didn't take people's troubles away. He gave them strength to go through those troubles. He gave them strength to endure to the end. And so we as the people of God, we will have trouble. Jesus said, in this world you will have trouble. But take heart, I've overcome the world. I'm not saying that these things will take all your troubles away. And second off, I'm not saying that these things will get rid of all your fear and anxiety. I know some people more than others face uh, overwhelming anxiety, face overwhelming fear. And I'm not saying this morning that if you do these three things, it'll be like magic bullets and you'll never have another fear. I want you to be clear on what I'm saying this morning. What I am going to give you this morning is an anchor in the middle of the trouble. An anchor in face of the fear. uh, uh, An anchor to hold on to when the world's falling apart. I can't give you a magic bullet to make everything better, but I can give you an anchor that you can tie your life to in the middle of the storm that will bring you through. 
So with that being said, I want to pray for us and then we will get into God's Word. Uh, Father, we thank you for this book that you've given us. We believe that it's your Word and we believe it's perfect in all of its ways. God, we ask that you would give us wisdom as we approach this book this morning and that we could see your Word for what it is. God, we live in such troubled times. You're well aware of that. God, we want to have peace in the midst of trouble. So God, I pray in these next few moments that you would open our eyes to that. And get you, God, that you give us a revelation of that in this moment. God, I pray that we as a body would be united. And God, that we'd be anchored to you. In Jesus' name, amen. If you have your Bible, turn to John 14. John 14. If you don't have a Bible, there's one in front of you, a gold back Bible. If you don't own a Bible, you're more than welcome to take that Bible home with you. That's our gift to you. We want you to have that. John 14. I need to set the scene for you before we approach this passage of Scripture. We need to understand the weight of the words of Jesus in John 14. Jesus is approaching the end of his earthly life. He is approaching the cross and he's brought his disciples together for one more meal together. This is the last time that Jesus would eat with his disciples. This is the night before he would be betrayed and Jesus brings them in to celebrate the Passover supper. And as they come in, he sits them down and he washes their feet. And he shows that he didn't come to be served, rather to serve. Jesus, uh, then he, he serves them dinner. And he says, hey guys, one of you will betray me. And then he tells Peter, hey Peter, you're going to deny me. And he tells these guys, no matter what you do, love one another as I have loved you. And that's kind of where we pick up in the story. And this is what it says in John 14.1. Let not your hearts be troubled. Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. If I could this morning, I'd like to express a little bit of frustration with Jesus' words in this passage. He's uh, looking at these 12 men in this room and Jesus is facing the cross and he knows what they're about to face. They'll uh, see their Messiah. They'll see the one they love, the one they've given their life to. They'll see him brutally murdered on the cross. And he looks at them and he says, Hey guys, don't let your heart be troubled. I feel like in that moment that for me, I, I think, Jesus, that's easier to say than do. Jesus, that's easy to say you're God. But I have this tendency that my heart gets troubled. Jesus, I know that it seems simple to you to not let your heart be troubled. But it seems like when everything's falling in around me, it seems like kind of a big task. Jesus, I don't know if you realize this or not, but it's easy to let your heart become troubled. As I was thinking about this, I thought, Jesus did, I know you were speaking to these disciples, and I know that you were speaking to us as as modern day believers through the portal of history. But I, I just thought to myself, it's maybe times were simpler then. 
Maybe it was easy to not let your heart be troubled back 2,000 years ago, but it seems like with the threat of ISIS and nuclear war and domestic terrorism and mass shootings and all these things that weigh down on us, economic problems, job problems, marriage problems, it seems like it's a little more difficult than just saying, oh, don't let your heart be troubled. Are you with me this morning? Do you know what I'm talking about? This, this doesn't seem like the answer. It seems kind of frustrating more than anything. But I want to show you what Jesus follows up with. He said, don't let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. I feel like on first impressions that Jesus is just changing subjects. He's like, all right, we got, don't let your heart be troubled out of the way. Now, let's move on to the next thing. Believe in God. Believe also in me. But I don't think that's what Jesus was doing. I think he was following this up. He was giving us the how-to. So Jesus says, believe in God. These men that were following him, they did believe in God. They did believe in God. They were devout Jews. They believed in God and clearly they believed in Jesus. He was standing right in front of them. And so when Jesus says, believe in God and believe also in me, I don't think he's talking about a surface level belief. I don't think he's talking about a belief like, yeah, I believe God's real. I don't think that it was just a surface level belief that said, yeah, I think Jesus was a guy in history. I think that it was something deeper than that. And here's what I believe that it is important for us to believe about God. To have peace in troubled times. That was a mouthful of sentence right there. Here's what we need to believe about God. To have peace. That's a little simpler. We need to believe that God is good. Do you believe that God is good? Really? Really? Do you believe that when life falls apart? When there's no money in the bank? Do you believe that when the marriage is falling apart? Do you believe that when the child is out on the rocks somewhere? Do you believe that God is good? Satan never tries to get you to stop believing in the existence of God. He tries to convince you that God is not good. If he can convince you that God is not good, you'll stop believing in God on your own. In the very beginning, in the Garden of Eden, God told Adam and Eve, he said, you can eat of any of the fruits in the garden except this one. Don't eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. They said, okay. They lived there for some time. We don't know how long. But then Satan comes in. And he didn't say, there is not a God. That's not what he said to Eve. He said, did God really say you can't have any fruit? Did God really say you can't have anything in the garden? He was saying to Eve in the garden, God's holding out on you. God's holding back for you. God is not really good. God does not love you and so he holds back from you. Satan wants to convince us That God is not good because if he can convince us of that in our storms, we will look to God and blame him. We'll look to him and we'll say, this is your fault, God. You could have done something. You'll look to God and you'll say, there's no way there could be a good God and this be happening to me. 
When we start going through trouble, Satan begins whispering in our ears, God does not care for you. God doesn't care about this. He has bigger things to worry about. God doesn't care what happens with this. Stop bothering him with that. God doesn't love you. He knows what you've done. God doesn't want you. You've done too bad. You've gone too far. That's what Satan whispers in our ears all of the time. So we need to believe that God is good. We have to have a deep-seated conviction that God is good. He's good in the middle of our troubles. He's middle. He's good on the best day and He's good on the worst day. God is good all of the time. Growing up, I heard this scripture in Romans 8. And said, if God is for us, then who could be against us? And you know, growing up, I, I didn't really have a problem believing that. I believed I grew up in a, a, a strict church, kind of a legalistic church. And uh, I didn't have any problem believing that God was all-powerful. I didn't have any problem believing that God could do whatever He wanted to. I didn't have any problem believing that God was infinite in knowledge and power. I believed that He was limitless in all of His ways. I believe that if God was for me, who could be against me? But I wasn't really sure that God was for me. I knew that if He was, I was in a good place. But I wasn't sure if God was for me. I'd listened to those lies of, the, of Satan saying, Hey, God doesn't want you. You've done too much. You've gone too far. You're not qualified. You're not worthy. I listened to those lies of the enemy and I believed that God could do whatever He wanted to, but I wasn't sure if God was for me. But friend, could I tell you today that God is for you. And if you ever wonder about whether God loves you or whether He doesn't, if you ever wonder about whether God is good or if He isn't, just look to the cross. The cross stands as our reminder today that God is good. He does love you. He does care about whatever's going on in your life. He does care. That song we sang earlier it said, I cast my mind to Calvary. Where Jesus bled and died for me. Sometimes in the middle of your storm... Sometimes in the middle of everything trying to overwhelm you and overtake you and things coming from every different direction, that's exactly what you need to do. I'm going to cast my mind to Calvary. I'm going to just think about for just a few moments in my day what Jesus has done for me. And as I put my mind on Jesus and as I put my mind on what He's done for me, I'll be encouraged, and fear will have no place in my life. If I had to sum up what we need to believe about God in one sentence, it would be this. God cares more about you than you care about you. God cares more about you than you care about you. Do you believe that? I get pretty consumed with myself sometimes. Could I be honest with you this morning? I get worried about Cody and what Cody needs and what Cody wants and all this stuff. I'm sure you don't do that. But um, when I think about, I think about myself a lot, if I could just be honest with you. And you probably do too. But uh, God thinks about me more than I think about me. God cares more about me than I care about me. God cares more about my finances than I care about my finances. God cares more about your marriage 
than you care about your marriage. God is worried about what you're worried about. He cares. Whatever it is. God cares about what's going on in your life. He cares about what's happening. And so if you don't take anything else away from today, I want you to take this. That God cares more about you than you care about you. Take that, believe that, hold on to that. God loves you and He cares for you in the midst of the storms. And when you're overwhelmed by life and things just seem to be coming and you're not sure how much more you can take and you're not sure about you're not sure about the outcome of things, just remind yourself. God cares more about this than I care about this. God cares more about this than I care about this. He is going to take care of it. Some of you came to church today to hear just this. God is going to take care of what you are so worried about. Take that in. God is going to take care of it. Let Him have it. Believe in God and believe also in me. Then Jesus... Right after that, he says this, In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself. That where I am, you may be also. And you know the way to where I'm going. Thomas said to him, I love this, I can just see Thomas. Jesus says, you know where I'm going. And Thomas kind of raises his hand. He says, no we don't. We don't know where you're going, Jesus. Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? And Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. And no one comes to the Father except through me. If you had known him, you would if you had known me, you would have known my father also. From now on you do know him and have seen him. So the first thing we need to do is we need to believe in God. Believe that he's good. And the second thing that we need to do is we need to look forward to heaven. We need to look forward to heaven. When life seems to overwhelm you, when life seems to be too much to handle, Anxiety and fear are creeping up in your heart. Here's what you need to realize. This will pass. This is just a moment. This is not forever. We're just here for a, a, a little short period of time. This world, it is not our home. We're just passing through. This is not what we're designed for. We're not designed for all the, the hurt and the pain and the frustration that we experience in this world. We were designed for heaven. We were made for heaven. This world, it's not our home. Heaven is our home. Heaven is what our hearts are longing for. Heaven is what we desire. Jesus said, I'm going to prepare you a place. Think about that. Jesus is not just preparing a place for humanity in general. It's not just one room. He's preparing you a place. Think about that. Jesus is fixing a place for you in heaven. I wonder if Jesus is a pretty good interior designer. I bet he is. Yeah. It won't really matter when we get there because we'll spend the first three or four billion years just worshiping him. But one day we'll probably get to see our place. And I bet it'll be pretty cool. Mine will probably have deer heads everywhere.
Jesus is making you a place in heaven. He's preparing you a place in heaven. There is a room in heaven with your name on it. Pretty cool, isn't it? It's important when our life seems to be falling apart to remember that this is not our final destination. We're on a journey, and this is not where we're going. One day we'll get to go home. We'll get to go home. The song Beulah Land says, I'm kind of homesick for a country to which I've never gone before. Have you experienced that? That when life seems so hard, there's a longing in your heart. Deep down inside, it's, it's way stronger than a craving for any kind of food or anything else you've ever had. It's just a longing to be home. This world can never satisfy that longing. But one day, we'll get to be home with Jesus. Our hearts will be satisfied at last. And we will be full. We'll get to look full. And His wonderful grace. This, this world is not our home. We have hope beyond this life. We have hope beyond our circumstances. This is not the end. This is only the beginning. Church, your worst day on earth is your worst day ever. There will not be any bad days in heaven. There won't be any bad days in heaven. You just get through this. You just push through this. I promise you, one day there'll be no more bad days. There'll be no more arthritis. There'll be no uh, more waking up sore. There'll be no more pain. There'll be no more killing. There'll be no more uh, hate. There'll be no more murder. The Fox News and CNN, they'll go out of business because there won't be nothing bad to talk about anymore. And all it'll be is glory. All it'll be is heaven. All it is be, it'll be is standing in the presence of Almighty God, worshiping the one who died for us. Amen. Amen. We have not only hope of heaven, but we have hope that Jesus is coming soon. I have a conviction in my heart that I believe Jesus is returning for his kids. He's coming for me, and He's coming for you. When I was young, that brought fear up in my heart. I was afraid for Jesus to come back, but now, it's like the Bible says, Come, Lord Jesus, come quickly. I feel in my heart a desire to see my Savior, to see Him coming in the clouds with glory. On our darkest day, on our darkest night, in the worst of circumstances, we can have hope that soon Jesus will return for you and me. He's coming back for those who have put their faith in Him. John 14, 16, and 17, this is just down from where we've been reading. It says, I will ask the Father, and He will give you another Helper. To be with you forever. And even the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him for he dwells with you and will be in you. And then I want to jump down to verses 25 and 27. It says this. These things I have spoken to you while I am still with you. But the helper, the Holy Spirit whom the Father will send in my name. He will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I said to you. Now here we go. Peace I leave you with. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your heart be troubled. Neither let it be afraid. 
neither let it be afraid. The last thing that I believe Jesus is telling us for troubled times is that we need to learn to trust in the Holy Spirit. Jesus said, I go, but I'm going to give you a gift. In the ESV, it's called the Helper. In the King James Version, it's called the Comforter. In the message paraphrase, it's called a friend. Jesus says, I'm going to send the Spirit of Truth, the Holy Spirit, to live with you. The Holy Spirit, when you're born again, it moves inside of you. He's the third part of the Trinity, so He's God. It's not an it, it's a He. The Holy Spirit moves on it, the inside of you. And so you can have confidence on your darkest days and your worst nights that living inside of you is the power of God. Living on the inside of you is the life of God. The breath of God. He is the one who helps us during our worst battles and our greatest victories. The Holy Spirit is the one who comforts our broken hearts. He is the friend that sticks closer than a brother. He's an ever-present help in a time of need. All that you need can be provided by the Holy Spirit who lives in you. You have the power of God in you. In the darkest nights when your heart is troubled, you can remember with all the confidence in the world that God is living in me. You have God. The same God who who hung the stars and breathed out Uh, of the universes. You have that God living on the inside of you. Romans 8 says that the very same Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead is living inside of you and giving life to your mortal body. That should give you some confidence. When everything seems to be falling apart, you can say, no matter what happens, I have the Holy Spirit living inside of me and I can get through it. I have God on my side. God is within me. How could I fail? You can be encouraged because greater is He that is in you than he who is in the world. You have something living on the inside of you that is stronger, more powerful than anything in this world you may face. The Holy Spirit. He's living inside of you. And do you know what His main job is? To bring you peace. To bring you peace. He's given you peace. He's given you hope. He's given you love today. Jesus said, Peace I give unto you. Not like the world give I you. Let not your hearts be troubled and neither let them be afraid. The world can give you peace when there's no trouble. The world's brand of peace can only provide peace when there's no trouble around. But Jesus today, through the work of the Holy Spirit in our life, can give us peace in the face of trouble. We can have peace in the middle of the storm. We don't have to wait on the storm to be over to have peace. We can have peace in the middle of the storm. God has given us a peace today that passes all understanding, that passes all circumstances. And you can live in that peace. So today I want to challenge you. Believe in God. Believe in God. Trust the Holy Spirit. Don't be afraid. Don't let your heart be troubled.
neither let it be afraid. Today I want to give you an opportunity. At the end of every service, I want to give people an opportunity to respond to Jesus and what He's done. Just to be clear about what we believe Jesus has done. We believe that Jesus came and that He lived a perfect life and that He died a substitutionary death. He died in our place so that we wouldn't have to. He was murdered on a cross. He was buried in in three days' time. He rose up victorious over death, hell, and the grave. And we believe today He extends to us a relationship with God. He says to us today, come and be friends with God. Come be in relationship with God. And here's how you do that. By believing the message about Jesus. Romans 10, 9 and 10 says, believe in your heart that Jesus raised from the dead and confess Him as Lord with your mouth and you'll be saved. Believe and confess. If we had to sum up salvation today to one word, it would be surrender. Surrender to Jesus. Surrender to His will for your life. Surrender to Him as Lord of your life.